me. I've had a whole glass of wine, quite drunk, um, and Rick's in charge, not. Okay, so I'm hiding. So pretend you've not seen me. Ladies and gentlemen, Rick! <laughs> this really isn't the way round it was meant to be. Um, I do have an introduction written, which I'm going to read anyway, um, but you've all now met her anyway, so anyway, here goes. So, uh, I met this next guest, or I wonder who that could be, uh, in the Groucho around 10 years ago, uh, and have been both honoured and privileged to work with her since. This lovely, talented lady is a comedian, writer and actress who emerged as part of the alternative comedy boom at the beginning of the 1980s and has now become nothing short of a national treasure. I'm sure you'll agree with that. You will have seen her on Naked Video and as Catriona in Absolutely Fabulous. You will have seen her in The Young Ones and even more recently in Hollyoaks. She was one of the Coronation first... Street, sorry. <laughs> No, you were in Hollyoaks. I was, but more recently, Coronation Street. Just saying. Yeah. I, I, I know you have no idea who this person is, but apparently she's in Coronation Street as well. Um, so, she was one of the first female stand-up comedians to appear on ITV's Saturday Night Live and then performed on the West End stage in the Vagina Monologues. She has appeared on Celebrity MasterChef, Loose Women, and Countdown. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. I'll allow that. Crack on. Crack on, Rick. I'll crack on. Um, she's a wine expert, and in 2018, she founded the now very successful literary prize called Quip to recognise and reward comedy women in print. Hot on the heels of her wonderful comedy novel, Losing It, which you can also buy, but not here, uh, this exceptional artist and performer has now written her memoirs, and we are enormously privileged to have her talking about it and her career to date, here with us in Hartford today. And there is a short film, so you might be able to guess who it's it is. It's an hour! An hour's <laughs> cooking! Question is, she left me now. 
my dear Lord, that sure is yeah. heaven to tell you. This little child was brought to us on dark and stormy night. She came to us an orphan. Mm-hmm. A dumb and physically disadvantaged orphan. Yep. A dumb, physically disadvantaged, ugly little orphan. Yeah. Hey, baby Sue. Why don't we tell him about it yourself? Go on. Go on, baby Sue. <laughs> Hello, little girl. What can we do for you on this dark and stormy night? Mama has left us, Daddy is broken. We're all cold and wet. And so we were thinking, could we sit by your fire? Oh, do we are dry? Would you spare us a cookie? We try not to cry. But they did some clever machinery to make me sound like I could say, Oh, Rick's asking me some questions. Over to Rick. Back on. You have to use that one. Okay. okay. If you could take this okay. stand yeah. away. Yeah. I'll grab it. Yeah. One, number 14. Everyone is on it. Everyone is a pro. They're on it. It's serious. <laughs> we're moving the music stand. <laughs> we're dealing with it. And we're ready. Does well anyone, done to the man. I want to report to Sorry, does anyone remember this happening to me yesterday and last year? Yeah. <laughs> Bless you. Thank you, Dad. Right. It's still funny. Yeah, uh, yeah, thank uh, you. So far. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> Okay. Uh, so, I'm going to start with your connections with Hertfordshire because you studied at the University of Hertfordshire. I did. Don't sound so surprised, Rick. Um, so, it was one of those things. So, do you remember in the days when they had polytechnics? Yeah, because yeah, they don't have... That. Well, thank you. You see, now everyone owns up. But in those days, because I was one of those um, people that... Hmm, I didn't get great grades, shall we say. I don't know why. I was doing something else at the time. And then I had to do that year off. But it was so long ago... They didn't, they, it wasn't invented as a gap year. It was just like fucked up my grades year. Um, and so I did lots of interesting things, which is in the book. Rick has not read the book, which I'm told doesn't matter. It's not a crime. I don't, who else has read the book here? Nil point. Oh, Beverly has. One person. Okay, right. So See, this is why you're all going to buy the book. Yeah, the yeah, yeah, exactly. No, Rick's right. You don't, you know, because the whole thing about, you know, having an unrehearsed show and talking about bits and bobs, you don't, you're quite right, you don't want to. But um, in that year off, when I had that slight shame of not getting the greys, I did do um, some stuff in the book, including being a masseur, which I may touch on, but it is in the book, um, which is quite it's like interesting jobs. Um, and then um, when I did get to Hatfield Poly, um, they, t they had insisted that everyone had to do maths O level. So in the first thing, they said, Hands up, we've got maths. I, like, three times, you know, I, I managed to get my maths. <clears throat> Nobody had took, got maths. I thought, I've been lied to and lied to and lied to. Anyway, so um, it was a sociology degree, and then years later at the King's Head in Upper Street in Islington, they in, they had some graffiti on the ladies. Oh, Rick, you've dropped it. He's dropped his notes. Please help. Please, thank God you're here. Get those notes up. Well done. Thank you, that man. <clears throat> anyway, thank you. And they had the graffiti, and it said, um, "Collect your sociology degrees here." So this is a, so low brow degree, low brow. But now it's a university, isn't it? I was talking yeah. to someone. <clears throat> just joking, Rick. Could you cover me? Yep, I'm fine. Uh, anybody else joking? It's just Helen. Yes. <laughs> <coughs> yeah. So yeah, Hertfordshire. Um, so. I wanted to talk about your early life and influences, and we know part of that was here in Hertfordshire. 
But there weren't many female role models in the 70s and 80s, so who, who were your influences? Well, no, because it'd be interesting to see what other people think. I am choking again. It can't have been a hair, because <coughs> I haven't been near anyone. Hang on. <coughs> <laughs> So, what what, what, what does one say when one is, really one is politely choking? Just going to choke a lot now. Rick, say something in Yeah, so get your questions ready <laughs> while Helen's choking. Um, if, you, if they're about Helen choking, then fine. I'm there. That's I'm also back, good. I'm back on. What, back. Uh, what was the question? The question was about your early life and influence. Oh, role models. So if you think about when we were at school, uh, I mean, I think I'm sort of, I'm probably the oldest in the room, but there's some parity here without making any assumptions. So don't we all think, like, what were the comedy programmes that we all watched that kind of made us excited and then talked to other people in the playground? Because to me, that was the freedom from your parents and suburbia, wasn't it? Like when you got excited about comedy. And so in my day, do you remember... That was the week that was with, yeah, with yeah. David Frost. Does anyone yeah, remember yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. So I just remember, and that was, I think it was black and white, must have been. And, and they had Millicent Martin at the end singing a satirical song that maybe she'd written or somebody else had written for me. But I just remember that being so exciting and anarchic. And well, I wouldn't have known the word anarchic age 10, but it was like, that's what I wanted to do. And so I did a sketch show in my junior school where I was David Frost and everyone had to be guests and that's how um, that was probably my best moment ever of writing and performing anything and then I had to wait a very long time about 50 more years to uh, when I did my novel when I got that feeling back so it took a long time to just go to to be the driver of your own content and with an audience it's just so beautiful and it didn't happen, and as Rick rightly says, there, there won't, there weren't. Oh, the only other role model was uh, Joyce Grenfell, remember, with the kind of sticky out frock and the you know rustling sound of the fabric. And the thing is, she, I just remember as a child watching her and thinking that is genuinely funny or interesting or appealing in some way. But apart from that, um, the women who led their own comedy shows, I think after that, were largely impressionists, nothing wrong with it, like Marty Kane and uh, Janet, who was the, Janet Brown, uh, Janet Brown, yeah, uh, who did the voices, so, you know, and that's a great way into satire, some probably men would write the, the sketches, but you wouldn't get, um, uh, it wasn't normal, so when I started stand-up, uh, in 80, I think, I went to dodgy year at the drama school, which is in the book, very dodgy year. Um, by then, the title, Not That I'm Bitter, hopefully has got irony in it. I mean, I'm actually not bitter, but <laughs> Rick might disagree. I'm not. But but the idea in the title is to have some ir irony sort of double entendre to it. But where I suppose it counts is... Um, I'd started stand-up, um, French and Saunders were at the same drama school, they w were a double act, they'd answered an advert in the stage, you remember the days when you would answer adverts in a newspaper and you know, you'd phone up and just that whole way of life, so different now. Um, and then the comic strip had employed them and so we had, Emma Thompson was given her own show by John Plowman, she had come through the Cambridge Footlights. We had Victoria Wood, who had won on a talent contest. So two very different sort of backgrounds. They had their own show. Then we had French and Saunders. And then there were just no other slots for other women. Or, or I was crap, and I don't want to go there. Um, and so I remember um, sort of turning up to get meetings with John Plowman, head of commissioning at BBC. And he'd go, oh, great idea, Helen, but you know we've got something in the pipeline for Dawn French. And that was how it was for probably about 15, 20 years. Um, I, not that I'm bitter, but it's just, um, <laughs> it's just in terms of, they did wonderfully well in championing them, but if you were of a similar age or had similar ideas, like you would be talking comedically about similar influences, they go, well, no, we've already ticked that slot. So that was very much the time. And it is not that time now that you cannot move for women comedians, and I, I salute them all. Anyway, next question. Well, so 
do you think that mainstream women's comedians started about the same time as alternative comedy, or what did one precede the other? Well, I think alternative, there's always something new, isn't it, when, I mean, did you ever watch Dave Allen? Did people, yeah. see, I love Dave Allen, and he was kind of like a bit of a maverick, bit of, on his own. Um, I just don't remember, yes, yeah, so, so the alternative, who scored? Who scored? Which country? Who? England? Somebody, oh, we trust him, although he, one all. Oh, this is exciting. Okay, we just, okay, we can check in, but somebody's had to check. We weren't clear enough with, with him. We weren't, we didn't describe it fully enough. It seems that each team has scored. Anyway, um, so, um, yes, where were we? With the, yeah, the... the Alternative comedy. Yeah, comedy. so we, for, oh, a woman is leaving the building now. No, respect. Come back and tell us. Bring some sandwiches. Um, so, uh, yes, the, we had the women, yeah, we didn't, we followed the golfers. Do you remember the male comedians, all of whom had to play golf? Um, the Tarbuck and the, who were the other, Bruce? Yeah, they all met on the golf course and they were, and then the man, the Jiminy Cricket man in the Wellingtons, I think I even met some of them and they did gags and they were brilliant, but they did golf and gags and then there was alternative and then do you remember ben elton i mean ben elton is doing the tour right now um has anyone seen ben elton he should oh really what his recent show right because i wanted to catch his recent show because when he was promoting it on tv as you have to do which is all quite uh, nerve-wracking he he was so serious about it i thought ben who's gonna go because he's making commentary about the world which is in a you know shit state but i didn't i hope people would um you know get some gags ben elton is in this um book and men who i have slept with and it isn't a, <laughs> but it isn't a, a kiss and tell it's a very beautiful book because you um there is i'm a very honest person and some people have called it alarmingly honest which isn't a compliment i can tell you coming from a man um and um oh, but i have sort of talked about going up to edinburgh in 81 oh um have they scored more since oh bless you we were hoping you'd just give us an update it's also one all one all still one all in time to get a drink nobody else scored got it so no it's good to know because we must tune in to the wider world it's not just about me and rick um but um yeah, it is. oh yeah it is yeah so um so i was just saying i'd slept with ben elton just saying um and um and how that's interesting talking as an older woman about um, the connections, euphemistically or otherwise, with other comedians at the time, and how you know society's changed, and how do we talk about that kind of thing um, post Me Too? So I've I've um, I found some some people you know furrowed brows when I just think I'm a libertine, Rick. I'm a libertine, and I think one should talk about these things in a happy wet manner. So Rick was amazing. So Rick's in it. Harry Enfield's in it. Didn't ask his permission. He's the only one. That was dodgy. I wrote a rather late email to his agent. And then the agent said, he has received this. But I haven't heard back from... There's no pressing, is there? Um, no, cut that bit out. Um, but I don't ever say anything horrible about anyone because if you look back at your life and i'm sure hopefully we're all the same you just go look you know all the mistakes all the you know it would be awful to say something mean in writing about anyone even on an email just don't just don't go there so so Hannah's already had a go at me for not reading the book i know me. I, really badly <laughs> really badly i did um but um so you, you, you wrote Losing It, which yeah. was a memoir, uh, which was novel. a novel, yeah. before you wrote this memoir. Mm. What was the biggest difference for you in writing about yourself rather than writing a fiction? Well, the novel, I uh, hope, I was so proud of that because that, that, that was like 50 years after I'd done the David Frosting. So, you know, when you find a thing that works for you and it doesn't happen for everyone and it took me a very long time before I'm going, I'm really enjoying this because... You know when people expect comedians to be happy? 
And you think, why would you, I mean, what's happened there? So we all have to crack on. In fact, um, I saw a thing recently with Glenda Jackson, one of those talk movie things that was fascinating. And the interviewer said to Glenda Jackson, you know, famous actress, blah, blah, um, you know, um, and does it make you happy? And she looked very quizzically, she said, no. Um, and it was really <laughs> revelatory. And I thought, yeah, do, you do a job, you take it really seriously, and you're really good at it, and you're probably a, a brilliant person. And she was an MP for the winning team, as we know from last night. Um, but it's an interesting question, like, oh, if you're in comedy, you should be happy. It's another tangential thought. But anyway, um, because I think it is quite an anxiety-making uh, career move. Why would anyone... This is nice, I hope, although there is a football, but this is nice being an older person, you know, looking back on what you've done. But to do those gigs in the 80s, I wanted to do it, but it's in the book, you know, how I, all my rituals and what it would uh, require to get myself on stage. Um, but I wanted to do it. It's all very conflicted. Next question, please. <laughs> if somebody's not there, but, but we'll leave that because I respect the fact you're honest. Honesty is best, isn't it? Because if you'd lied, then I would have said that somebody suggested like, what um, on page thirty-seven, Rick? What struck out for you? <laughs> so no, it's cool. It's cool. I'd just like to say I wasn't given the choice. Just no, he it. wasn't. We're so mean. So we didn't give him a free book. Yeah. Sorry. So, anyway. So what? Were, so was it easy to write this book? Was it easy to remember? the things that you wanted to put in this book, or did they have to be teased out? Yeah, it wasn't easy, because um, I don't have much of a memory anyway, but what I've got, if anybody does want to purchase one from lovely Julia over there in your local, support your local indie bookshop. And Julia, uh, you're the only person who knows how much it is, so yes. please let everybody oh, they're know. Wait, they're looking at the book. No, don't say the price now! Just let them come out! Don't say the price! No! Don't, let's not do the price! Anyway, so at the beginning of the book, there's this kind of passive aggressive CV and at the end where I suppose the reason I wrote it was it wasn't one of those COVID biographies that people do quite sensibly. You've got to do something in COVID. Um, uh, it, it was just, I can't believe that I actually wanted to be a stand-up comedian um, on my own and do it. But it was a a passion and so I think it's quite interesting when you look back and you go I really wanted to, to I was passionate about it and really ambitious and I found another woman at an audition neither of us got theatre and education in Ipswich we didn't get it um, and that audition situation where you have to turn up and then everyone has to get into pairs and you have to kind of be really kind of out there so that the director might spot you anyway um, I found this wonderful woman and I thought you are so funny um, very different, sort of tall, thin, weird-looking woman, and I asked if she'd be a double act uh, partner with me because it's quite lonely on your own. Um, but don't feel sorry for me. I mean, I wanted to do it, so we did it for nine months. I stole her from another double act, and then she went back to her double act. We'd already got the gig, and I just ended up on my own doing it, thinking I can do it. So I did it for five years. French and Saunders, not that I'm bitter, didn't do stand up. Um, Emma Thompson, not one of it, didn't do standard. So I think actually a, a lot of the comp compunction to do it was, I'm this old now, I really did do that one thing that is a bit unusual. And I just, and in those days they didn't even have the internet or things, I don't think I'm even documented. It was probably in feudal times. I'm not in like a lot of the chronology of the things. So I had help from a journalist. And then we found all these things, you know, I, I, I have done it. And I think it's a peculiar thing to do, um, to drive your own content and turn up and uh, have some good gigs and some bad gigs and see where it takes you. But it's like now people talk about people who are neurodivergent and all these words and stuff. Um, but uh, so being out of the ordinary is uh, less judged. But being a woman as well, and not an entirely ugly woman, although um, I was, you know, like puppies are attractive. So when you're young, um, human beings are attractive, not because you're beautiful, but just because you're young. So it was a really sparkly time of doing gigs, meeting Rick and Ben, and um, wanting to do your own, drive your own content. It was really exciting. 
and pre-Me Too. So there is, yeah, I've mentioned that already. So that would be quite interesting for women of a certain age to, to see what happened in that area. Um, I, I ought to point out as well, I, I, it's a lovely when Helen keeps mentioning Rick, but I do think she means Rick. I Mayer. do, I do, I so do. I haven't slept with you as far as I'm aware. I'm right at the back. <laughs> I know, I know. I probably would have remembered, but who knows. Um, but, um, yes, um, but it was, um, uh, um, so, yes, so when I had done one of my shows at the Edinburgh, it was called Still Crazy After All These Years, and obviously I'd done quite a lot of therapy, like one does, um, very sort of cut price counsellors, grown up ones, you know, whatever. So I think the first grown up one I went to, um, she, I t and she said, Helen, for someone who hates authority figures, being humiliated in public and something else, you've chosen the very career that will give you all of this. In anyway, so I got a wife, and then she said, um, Helen, you have above average anxiety. Like I was supposed to be very thrilled. I thought, oh, above average, that's good news. Um, so um, that was quite an interesting journey into therapy. How did we get into that? Oh yeah, so the show, uh, Still Crazy After All These Years, was a, uh, a show where I'd gone into group therapy because it's cheaper. Um, and, um, and you have to be with a whole group of other people and not dominate, which I can manage, um, just. Um, and then there was a woman in the group who started every sentence with saying, I'm not being funny, but, and she wasn't being funny, I can assure you. And, um, and it was like trying to work out h how do you tease out problem solving in a group, right? So I obviously did a show, and then I said, by the way, um, I'm just telling you all out of your honesty thing, I'm doing a show, so please don't come out of respect. Um, nobody did, probably because they weren't very interested. But anyway, um, so uh, when I did that show, somebody was in the audience and from Hodder and Stoughton, a publishing company, and, and I was, um, by then, I'd met someone, got uh, married, divorced, had a child in about 18 months. So I did it quite fast, that was it, tick those boxes. And so they said, would I write a funny book about being a single parent? And this was like, I think in the 90s. And I thought, yeah, money, six months, I'll do that, I'll knock that one up. And, um, and so I wrote the book, um, and then I had to go on the, do you remember the Alan Titchmarsh at Pebble Mill? You know that Pebble Mill program where there's a stream behind in the glass windows or something like this? And in those days, men, or any interviewers, were just not familiar with women just talking, trying to be humorous, not trying to be humorous, I was asked to be humorous, about a situation so that it would uh, be truthful and in a way like this book. Um, and they didn't know where to put it in the bookshop. So Julia will know this. And they didn't know whether to put it in the kind of mental health thing or the comedy. And so it was like wavering. And it was called Single Minding. And dear old Alan Titchmarsh, he has not put me on his bloody weekend show. And it's fine, not that I'm bitter. Um, and uh, he was kind of perplexed in a sweet way as a man. Like, you know, as if I was advocating single parenting. Who scored? Any news? Switzerland? Or somebody's going to check. We need to know. We, what is it? Switzerland missed. What did you say? Oh, the, oh, the, the Swiss missed. Yeah. That's not very Switzerland, is it? Well, no, but we need to know. What's the score? He's not come back. Still one all. One one. One one is, I think, the same as one all, but what do I know about... So, so, extra time? Bloody hell. Oh, it's exciting, isn't it? Anyway, back to me. So, um, where were we? Oh, yeah, so Alan Titchmarsh. Yeah, so Alan Titchmarsh um, sort of pu looked very puzzled and said, but why did you get married? He couldn't fathom the thing. Whereas now, of course, or more recently, there have been sitcoms, and who's the American comedian, Canadian one, who's very beautiful? the new generation woman, or even not new now. Catherine Ryan. Thank you, Catherine Ryan. So she, yeah, so she did um, a sitcom about being a single parent. Was it called The Duchess or something? I've not watched it, but um, not that I'm bitter. No, um, but it's, um, it, it's interesting how in a kind of 20, 30, 40 year span, um, how, you know, different things are now not championed, but, you know, people are finding them interesting. Or, or, you know, as good as a Jimmy Carr series, let's say. But, but, but you yourself have always been a champion for women's comedy. Mm -hmm. 
So much so that, uh, and I remember you doing this, mm -hmm. you started your own literary awards called Quip, which is Comedy Women in Print. Yeah. And that's now become very successful and it's in its fourth fifth year. Yeah, it, I'm about to jump in again. So if anybody here has a novel in them or can write a novel before next year that, that's funny, preferably of, um, then you can apply and then you will get published. The winner gets published. So. The thing about looking back in the 80s and thinking, um, I wasn't, you know, people say, what's it like being a woman? And Victoria Wood did a great um, riposte to this because she said, well, I don't know what it's like to be a man, you know, and funny. So, but I think um, there weren't mentors. So it wasn't a kind of norm. You just had to get out there and crack on and do it. So when I did the novel and I got nominated, I've never won anything, which is fine. I think it's a fine place to be, to not win. But to be nominated is good. So I got nominated for this fancy prize and then I thought, I oh, will set one up for um, witty women writers. So yeah, comedy women in print. So if you'll do it, then you get published. And, and, and Julia will probably help me now, she likes me. And, it, and it's really Hopefully. growing as well, so please keep yeah. your eye on I think we just need a thousand pounds from everyone on the way out, we'll be fine. Yeah, that would do us. There's yeah. a box at the back yeah. with Helen's name, exactly. right? to face on it and everything. To face someone we'll for it. To yeah. So I wanted to talk about some things that maybe the audience don't know mm -hmm. about you, because mm -hmm. you were born in Wales, was. and you learnt to speak Welsh. Well, <laughs> let's not. <laughs> for an S4C television series, which I believe, with my knowledge of Welsh, is called S4C. Right? Uh, what does that mean? Is it S4C? Okay. Well, there we go. He knows more than me. Rick knows more than me. Oh, as ever. No. So, my dad was a refugee, just back in person. Had to come. So there's a whole bit about that. Um, had to come from another country. They sent him over early at a boarding school. Then I discovered a whole uh, host of stuff about my background through doing a reality documentary on Channel 5 called War Hero in my family. And when they phoned me up to do this, I did say, um, can I just check? Because obviously it's TV, so I want to be on it. Um, I said, can I just say, do you have to have a war hero in your family to <laughs> so sort of be eligible? Um, they said, yeah, they said it's a journey. So anyway, um, went on this journey, um, coming back to that, yeah, so I discovered um, that my grandfather had been a, a secret listener, it sounds completely balmy, but a Czechoslovakian person in a place eavesdropping on German prison people. But anyway, we'll, put, we'll park that, because I'm writing a spy film about that as we speak, so don't copy me anyway. But anyway, so back to where, oh yeah, so he was a civil engineer, so happened to be in Wales when I was born. So you know when people say in Wales, because there's so much money for film investment there, by the way, and they do everything there. They said, well, what, uh, what age did you leave Wales? You know, and I go, six months. And it's so bad. <laughs> so bad. If only we'd stayed, if only I'd stayed as an adult and could claim Welshness. Of Welsh godparents, but um, so they have this documentary um, where they would get random. We did. The f I always do the first of everything, just as because I'm not big enough to do that. When it's you know tried and tested, they'll just use me as a kind of thing. And there was that man, Lembit thing. Do you remember him, Lembit, the weatherman? Yeah. So you go, is he Welsh? Excuse me, is he Welsh at all? I suspect not. But I think he had a relationship with a Welsh person. So he was on the thing with me. And that was when he was doing that with the twins. Was it? Yeah, so weird. It was bizarro, so bizarro. So he was there thinking, you're so not Welsh. Um, and then we had to be in teepees and learn the Welsh language. Well, the woman who got the prize was the woman who was in the Ruth Jones the thing. Gavin and Stacey. And she plays the mother, godmother, the, the mother, not Alison Steadman, the other mother, thank you. So she won the prize, and then I got a Welsh blanket for the <laughs> person who had travelled the most. <laughs> so to answer your Welsh thing, there's a bit of a di uh, diversion there, but um, still got the blanket. Could, could do with it today. No offence. Anyway. Next so, question. So we're going to have an auction for that blanket mm. later. That's right. Um, who remembers Naked Video? 
nil point. Julia, again, we're returning to Julia, the book, the bookshop owner. Okay, no, the nice man, the Scottish man who sorted us out. Pat. Right. So, he's Irish? Yeah. The man is Irish? Yeah. Oh, my God. Scottish accent. No, but can you just say something so the audience can... Can you just say, um, lo uh, love your book, Helen, can't wait to buy it? No, I cannot wait to buy your book. Oh. Uh, is that Irish or Scottish? It's Scottish. It's Scottish accent. Yeah, you're Scottish. You're not Irish. Oh, now we get the history. <laughs> Regrets, I've had a few. <laughs> I was born in Southern Ireland, in, in Dundalk, just in County Louth, and my father had some financial problems, and as a family we left Ireland and moved to Scotland. But you do sound Scottish, I don't you? Well, I, I, I was only two when I moved to Scotland. That makes sense. I love this man, because he helped out there, but he does sound Scottish. Although we do have the Irish history the earlier, um, and it's nice to traverse yeah. different Celtic countries. Yeah, thanks for that. Pat. <laughs> enough problems. Oh, no, because, no, because what I love about Pat is that he remembered we went from Naked Video, didn't we, Rick? We did. So the um, so in the monologues, this is interesting. In the monologues for Naked Video, um, somebody helped me. Okay, he wrote most of them. Um, do you, have anyone seen Rabsi Nesbitt? Yeah. Oh, right, right. So the writer of Rabsi Nesbitt was just starting out writing, and um, he's in the book as well, someone I've also had a connection with. <laughs> with um, very erotic with the biro. No, Gregor Fisher I wasn't because he's married, but um, the other one, the writer. Anyway, so uh, he wrote the monologues. Uh, um, where lovely Pat uh, remembered there was a Scottish joke about uh, what did I say? I said, uh, would you like what was it like? Would you like a poke? No, no I've got it wrong. <laughs> Come on, thank God Pat's here. I, I, we'd just be we'd, we'd, there'd be nothing without Pat today. <laughs> what was it? The what was it, Dad? The camera's on you and your face, yeah. And the, the shop assistant says to you, You just bought things, would you like a poke with that? that. That's it, thank you. Would you like a poke with that? Now, obviously, most people would think, and then I think my reply, just continue this, Pat, my reply was, no, it's all right, I'm with someone, thank you very much. <laughs> that was the gag, that was the gag. And obviously in Scotland, thank you for clapping, I love you. So, <laughs> so the thing is that in Scotland, a poke is a bag, a bag, isn't it? Whereas uh, in England, it's a sexual act. Oh, how could it deconstruct a sexual endo and, and kill it? But anyway, um, so Ian wrote those monologues, but that character at Naked Video that only Pat has watched, it seems, and Julia, thank God, um, was kind of pre-Bridget Jones. So the, the character, so I got that job because I'd been doing stand-up. So the character had a file of facts. Did I still have one? Does anyone have a... Thank you. So it was a file of facts, a glass of wine, and clearly the woman had some kind of job and was, you know, look, uh, talking about her relationships. Ten years later, we had Bridget Jones. So, not that I'm better, but um, it, that whole thing about a woman with, a, with some kind of job and probably having some kind of sex life, um, you know, the, the sort of professional thing, was done then. And... Um, it, it, it was, that's why when you were asking very sensibly, you know, about role models and it's weird for us to, who, can you, who's my messenger? Get the messenger. We need to know which team. Uh, who? Another miss. Another, Another miss. miss. So people cheer at a miss. No, it was an England miss. So England miss or? Yeah, it was a gasp. What's with me? A gasp. Oh, a gasp. It was a gasp. It was a gasp. Okay, but we're still 1-1, one, one, yeah? Fine. Um, and so the, yeah, the, uh, that's what I'm saying about that, because I can't quite right. remember what I was saying. You, 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 you know that had nothing to do with the question that I was about no. to ask. No! What was it? So the question I was about to ask was, if, if you did remember Naked Video, there was a character called Sloan that Helen played. That, so does anyone remember 
her no, that was, recreating I, that yeah. character oh. in the Warnings Advocat. Okay, that's advert. where you're going. So that's does, anyone, does anyone remember the Warnings Advocat? Well, one, advocate? does anyone drink Warnings Advocat? Because that is... <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> it's, do you like? Do you like? <laughs> it's kind of egg custard? Yeah, egg no. Yeah. At Christmas. Uh, who would drink that in the summer? No, no. So... <laughs> No, because I can understand. It is quite strict custody. But anyway, I did get, that was the thing of adverts. So I've only done three adverts ever. And that was my first advert. And I couldn't believe the amount of money. You know, I thought that they lied. I thought, what, you're paying me that much? I was doing Naked Video at the time. And, um, and so the joke there was that I had to introduce, because I genuinely have to introduce everyone. So I had to introduce all the drinks to each other. But... I was on slimming pills at the time, which is quite makes life very exciting. <laughs> oh, they were brilliant. Has anyone else been on slimming pills? I could, no pressing. Um, but it, it, this was in the 80s and 90s, and I was at an audition, and somebody was teeny tiny and slumped. Um, <laughs> she had no energy. I said, you look amazing. What's your secret? And she said, put your pork pie down, and I'll tell you. Anyway, um, no, she told me, she told me the, this thing called Tenuate Dosban, so I went off to my Greek doctor in Finsbury Park, and I got, you just got them. So it meant that you would just get, it, well, you're on speed. So I didn't eat at all. And if somebody asked me for lunch, you go, why lunch? Why waste your time having lunch? Are you mad? So, and that was, yeah, so when I did the Sloan Ranger character, which I then did in Ab Fab later, um, because I don't think they have Sloan Rangers now, do they? I think they're no, extinct. No. But I think a, a Sloan Ranger is somebody with, a pearl, well, I've got pearls and a on. basket on the front of their bike. Yeah, absolutely. Yes. Well, that's a nice image. Basket on bike, um, cardigan, a bit like Diana in the early days, you know. But they don't have them now. But anyway, we've gone through. Is it time for questions? Or have but, I been here all well, day? I, 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 I was, I was <laughs> just going to mention that the, you, if you've been to uh, some of these uh, before, you would have noticed that most people on this stage have had a glass of water. You will have noticed, of course, that Helen has a glass of wine. Yep. And that oh. brings me on to the fact that Helen is a wine expert. And I have actually done a show with her called The Show-Off's Guide to Wine, which incidentally we're hoping you're going to do well, here next year. Maybe you want me to do that more than this. But, uh, but the, the wine thing is I'm an enthusiast and actually I had to do, because I'm promoting the book and I went to Brighton Festival and then there were two wine experts there and you go, wow. But, I, but the thing is, once I went on that course, has anyone here ever done a multiple choice thing? Because that is hard. A multiple choice uh, exam is like, like trick questions. Like I'd rather just have a question. Anyway, but I did. Because the Daily Express said, um, they would I like to do their wine column? And I thought, why me? Why me? And then they said, well, we thought that you had the kind of face that looked like you liked a glass. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that was me in. And then I just started, and then I thought, actually, maybe I should go on a course. And then you get letters, if you made, quite right, if you made a mistake. And I said something wrong about port. And I thought, oh, shit, you've got to. So I'd go to these tastings. And then you'd see people spit out a lot, and you, you do that, like, spit. I don't know I spit very nicely, but... Anyway, so so I did get into it, but I'm not, like, you know, a top top. I'm just, I know a bit. You're growing I'm, your own grapes in your garden. Yeah, I, I have grown... Has anyone done that here in Hartford? You've done everything in Hartford. There's nothing you don't do in Hartford. Has, has any, well, grapes? No, no one's done <laughs> Milk what? But anyway, yeah. I know a bit about wine, but not a lot. And I think it's one of those things you have to know a lot to say you know a lot. So I'm rather people well, are interested I, I, in my comedy, I, actually. Yeah, to be really <laughs> modest, I know that <laughs> Helen knows quite a lot about wine. Mm. Right, so Helen is, uh, as you can see, getting very fed up with me asking I'm questions. I'm exhausted. You can tell, can't you? <laughs> uh, so we're going to open it up to the audience now. So has anybody got a question for Helen? I'm, oh. The I'm assuming shoot. there's going to be quite a few. Yeah, oh, Wilson, well, so we know fo the football feedback first. <laughs> one, still 1-1. One, one. Thank you. Okay, and the man with the hat had the hand up. Okay, so I think um, I think someone's going to have to oh. come and bring my it's microphone to you. It's Pat. 
Like man, the man of all trees. <laughs> <laughs> can jump in. You're a star so, bat. Um, no, this is nice. I don't think I've done a gig in a tent, and it's not raining, and it's and it's everyone's nice. And this is Paul Hilder, a very good guitarist. Oh wow! Oh, I met Jacko um, in Tring, Paul. Do you know Jacko, who plays no, with um, no, I don't have something it. crimson? I feel like I know you, but I don't. Uh, that's, all we, uh, that's life. What's your question? Uh, my question is, where are you with Irene Handel? Oh, that, where am I with her? I well, think she's passed well, over, hasn't she? Yes, but what, she was a great um, unsung comedian. Yes. Did some great things with Peter Sellers. Model. Yes. Very funny. Yes. Uh, what a lovely question. I love that book. I'll tell you why. That is so interesting. Because the first proper play I did, um, no, yes, um, was called Having a Ball, written by Alan Bleasdale. And um, it was set in a vasectomy uh, clinic, obviously. And then weirdly, the weirdest thing is that the man who played the main part, I'm sorry to be rude, but had to be naked and had to have a small... Penis, if I can take this. And it was just weird, and he was quite open about it. So I don't know how they did the auditions. I am coming back to answer your question. But it was just so weird that I thought, why have I got this job? All my jobs have been weird. There's no normal job. Everything requires doing something. So I had to be on stage with David, can't remember his surname, but he was like a proper actor with maybe a small penis. I, did, I didn't look, but anyway, he's naked all the time. Uh, for the vasectomy clinic that Alan Bleasdale had. She's looking well, horrified. Who's there. looking horrified? There, down there. Oh, next Soz. To the, next to the gentleman with the... With oh, the Soz, have I got... No, but the answer, but to respond to your Irene Handel, or Handel, as you'd say, um, in the review, Paul, mm. they said that I was like a younger version of Irene Handel. How? And it's just come back to circles. Yeah, and you said that, and that's just such a beautiful question. I've seen seen you and you do come over a bit and that that's a compliment yeah a bit I'm a, what I'm a big fan of you. <laughs> <laughs> and she also it's speaks like very high and you. a lot younger yeah yeah because irene's passed but i think she did a lot of good work but um people are unsung um and hence if you do i wish you'd written maybe she has written a book but she interests me she's an interesting person so i love the fact you've cited her well, you have a question at the front, Pat. We've got one at the front. Well, we have Graham, one of our local song writers. Oh! Yeah. Uh, what about Charlie's? Um, what advice would you give to anyone who wants to do entertaining or mm. you know, like yourself and like, write a book or yeah. like that? Yeah. Oh, so, yeah, so that's an interesting question because you think, you know, if you haven't started, how do you just jump in? I totally get that. I think that's a really brilliant question because I sometimes look back at me and actually in the book, yeah. uh, why did I do stand up? You know, why did I do a thing that where you have to kind of um, win people over? Let's say um, you, you've got to come on and then because you're called in my case a comedian only because you're sandwiched in those days between men and so and people are going oh. You're a comedian, so prove it. You know, all that stuff. That, so nothing is, um, there isn't necessarily a warmth. Uh, you, you have to kind of prove it. But then you have to go, well, the advice would be, if you really want to do it, um, then you must, if you really want to do it. And then I would always say to myself, um, I'll give myself another year. That helped me. Because then, like, I would say to any, like, person in stand-up, you go, like, if... Say if you're not getting any gigs in 10 years, let's say, then maybe you should go, do you know what? The, the world is a big place. You don't have to do this one thing. And, and, and another theme in this book is I'm not an elite. I'm not French and Saunders. In fact, I'm propping up the elite by not being a member of the elite. And when I did a podcast with Richard Herring, um, it was quite interesting because he said we're middle. And, and I think maybe in all walks of life we're guilty of, well not guilty, that should, that's a bad word. We compare ourselves with other people, we just do. And it was really fascinating that even people like the men, who would, I think do better than women, they would, and Robin Ince, who I did in Trim, you know, they are really conscious of where they're at and where they're not. So um, I think you, if you want to do it, 
jump in and give it everything, and then after a time, maybe just assess it. And you don't have to be top to, for it to be meaningful. You really don't. I'll sing a, I'll sing and play the guitar. Pat, could we have the microphone if I may? Uh, geez. I sing and play the guitar, and me and Pat have come this way over the years, and um, it's really helped me. And Brilliant. always gives me a chance to play at his folk nights. But isn't that really so? Uh, so that answers that because if you do it, if you actually do it, then you'll know. And I think it's the hardest thing is not being given the opportunity to start. Like, how would it have been for me if I hadn't got the gigs? I mean, everyone has to start somewhere just to get a taste of it, just to get a feel of it. And clearly, you like it, yeah? Yep. So there you go. Thank you, Pat. I tell you what, Pat's a bit of a saint tonight, bloody hell. <laughs> Great question. question. <laughs> I think this is the tax man. What's oh. <laughs> oh my God. <laughs> oh, hello. Hello. Uh, I just wanted to ask, and I don't want to make you bitter, but have you worked with... <laughs> Miriam Margulies. Well, interesting question. I've done two things with her, but not big things with her. I do admire her very much. One, because she's really brainy, because she went to Cambridge, didn't she? So, um, but the very first time I met her, it was some kind of chat thing in some kind of venue that was dark, you know, like you have to do. And, um, okay, there's no pressing. No, she was better, with good reason, I may say, because being in the Cambridge Footlights, and this is like a generation or two generations, I'd like to think, before me, she was not given the opportunities. So she is not frightened, as I'm sure like everyone knows, at all um, of citing that. So that's hard. If you know you're an individual and you're good and you're funny, which she clearly is, and to not be given the opportunities within the peer group, even when you're a student, you would remember that. But um, I guess I'm going to ask you a question about what you think about her. But I, what I take away from Miriam is on the, with the Graham Norton thing, didn't she do that masturbation story about a tree or something? Something happened and you just go, oh my God, she's like that aunt that I sometimes fear I am. You go, oh my God, that awkward aunt at the table that just goes one step too far. You go, you were fine until you did the masturbation story. Do you know what I mean? And, um, so what, what's your take on Miriam? I love Miriam. Yes. Um, well, talking about Graham Norton. Yes. I think the best thing she ever said was she, she said to Will I Am, Oh, gay? Oh, a lesbian? I'm one of those. <laughs> <laughs> yes, no, absolutely. She speaks her mind. You should, no, I, I couldn't agree more. And because she stands out, on um, one, she's extremely talented in, in the, every single way, um, we don't have many women who would do that. So we probably see, quite rightly admire her, also probably call her eccentric. Yeah. So I'm just saying, and it's not, we just have to accept that we haven't caught up. It's not normal, there's no parity. But um, I think she's fun. Um, but I think um, she, I, I liked her documentaries particularly. Uh, it, that le latterly, w w really going for topics. I mean, clearly, really brainy. So I think she's given us loads. So a, a real value. But very rude, very rude. And if she fancied you, it would be quite interesting what to do. She never fancied me, so that's fine. Um, so no, I'm just saying it's quite interesting. You know, like bold, good, masturbation on the sofa. Okay, good. Uh, salute it. If only I thought of that. No. <laughs> no, I love her too. It's good. Um, did you ever play the comedy store? Yes, I did play the, the comedy store. And in fact, in a sad way, I'm even saying that there is a photograph of me looking rather serious and sad on the, on the stairs going up. Um, but that was when, please tell us that he's either getting a refill or so. Was, no, but if anyone scored, will you tell us, please? We have to know. Um, so with the comedy store, so I was with my double act when I did that. We didn't. We did it about three times, and I begged Ben Elton, who in the red jacket, went to the Pizza Express with him, and sort of begged him to put us on. 
and he did. And then that was a weird thing because in the original comedy store, it was like a strip club. That and so there were people who probably come to the like thinking they were there. And a person in the audience asked to see a body part of mine, which even though I've said masturbation, I can't say this other word. I, I respect Hartford too much. <laughs> and I, but the thing is, I hadn't heard that expression that because I'm quite a middle class suburban person. So then I had to ask the person to repeat it. He said, can I see your word? And then I said, I'm so sorry, you want to see me? So the person had to say it twice, which is all very embarrassing. And then I um, said, oh, I haven't brought it with me tonight. And the, but, um, <laughs> So, but it was quite interesting because it, it wasn't normal in that way, but I have done it, but I, I wouldn't, um, that's not a happy place. Did you find it elitist? Uh, elitist in this, yeah, everything is elitist, uh, and I agree with that notion. I mean, it is, it's like, who makes it top? Mostly men in those days, but also now not. We live in a world of people who get there, and people who don't. And the important thing is to keep your spirit high a, a lot in this book, because I was there doing all those programs that you maybe would remember. I was there doing Bossum and Abfab and all that. I was there, but only a small amount of people are ever in the top. And we have to remember that. That's like a minority of people. The rest of us are still doing the work, but um, not that I'm bitter. But I like that question, yeah. Uh, comedy store, yeah. Goes to the comedy store. There is that really sad photo of me looking very unfunny. Oh, a hand behind. A hand behind with the scarf. Yeah. Mm. And um, what would you say would be your highlight of your career and possibly even the lowest work ever? <laughs> I always do the lowest. Why do we do the lowest first? Um, Please don't say this. <laughs> Rick. <laughs> no, no, not at all. Not at all. Joking, joking. Uh, you're a very uh, well-intended person. And I think that's a nice... But that's a compliment. That's a compliment. That's nice. Um, so, um, I think doing gigs, doing gigs where you go on and then there's a kind of... It's like disappointment when you just walked on the stage and then you might see people looking at their watch. That's why I'm really conscious, but there is a football. I think I'm over being an obsessive, I'm over conscious. Um, and then not being able to pull it back because there's only a certain amount of things you can do in any situation. And that's why it's great. You go, okay, this isn't what I expected, but hey, just roll your sleeves up and get on with it. But that's being a, an old person. Um, and then just knowing that it's bad, and just really knowing it's bad. And then really you want a car on the stage to just take you away really quickly so you don't have to see anyone. And I do remember at um, BBC Light Entertainment Radio, they had these parties at Christmas. So if, if you'd been in a radio programme, you were like that year, you were invited. And I went there and everybody just wanted to get jobs there. So you'd go and you'd get your yellow wine and you just go, I'm going to hit on someone, a producer, and I hit on this um, producer called Bill Dare, just naming him. Oh, they're ready for the next gig. Fuck, have I been boring? Shall I stop? No, 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 I'll do the end of the story. Sorry, 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 sorry. Anyway, but you know that thing when men, and I, I'm not looking in case I'm rude now, but um, when men wear reefer jackets, you know that thing where they have like, has he got, no, he hasn't, but like gold, <laughs> like gold anchor buttons, you know that blazer thing with the men and the producer, with the, it's called a reefer jacket. Anyway, Bill Dare. So I hit on him thinking, you're a producer, and then I thought, I've sent so many scripts to the, you know, like, I've written, and so I said, um, so what, what do you think of me in a cheerful sort of way, in my kind of, what's the word did I say before, the divergent, the new modern word, anyway, I just say what I think, which can be alarming, but I don't mean it to be, um, and he said, you're high maintenance. And I just thought, that's really interesting. In, in those days, a woman sending, obviously I'm making a point here, but if you send in your stuff, how else do you get people to know, like you, your question, really important question, I mean, how do you get people to know that you want to do your work if you don't communicate that you want to? But anyway, it was high maintenance. Um, I put that in the book. Um, highlight, don't have any one. I don't have any highlights. I think, um, I think maybe now, to be honest, just doing the memoir, 
and actually meeting really nice people and not, I mean, next year I will do a, a, a show, it's going to kill me, but I'm going to do it like a proper show, like Jenny Eclair does, not that I'm bitter. Um, I will I'll do a proper show. But this is a beautiful thing that people just choose to come and then we get the questions and we meet the people and and I am proud of this and the Observer has given it a good review which I think is important um, and so even though I'm not mainstream um, it's a message we should all you know like you get to this age you're fucking right about it and show off slightly anyway thank you very much for being <laughs> Bring the old bike back. Yeah. Yeah. Just a slave to that, man. What, Danny? I'm just a slave to that. You are. I mean, everything. <laughs> slave to everyone, it strikes me. Pat, it's so obvious that Helen likes you best. <laughs> I do. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> So, um, the book is at the back. We've got a very limited amount of books. My wife is holding it up at the yeah, back. Yeah, Beverly's there. there. Beverly's Not standby. Not that I'm bitter, it's called, just in case you didn't get that. <laughs> um, and, uh, and Julia from the Book Nook is, is there as well. And that She's is your local bookshop, isn't it? wonderful lady who's yeah. brought these books, yeah. books with her. Um, as I said earlier, Julia is the only person who knows how much these books are. So, please ask her at the back um but look it, it's been brilliant oh you? no i love rick really i give him a bad time but he's all right but can i <laughs> can i say if you don't want helen to get as angry with you <laughs> As she has got with me for no, not yeah. reading her book, know, then go and buy the about. book and read it <laughs> and don't be a Rick Mason because, no. <laughs> because that is a no no. It's, it's bad. bad. It's very bad. <laughs> so, listen, thank you so much, Helen. Ladies and gentlemen, Helen Levin. Oh, thank you. And thanks to Rick. Well done, Rick. You did really well. Thank you. So I will go over there. So there's no music. Pretend there's music filling the side. Just sing to yourselves, please, as she makes her way to the back. Okay. Taking the glass. Going down here. Oh, that's what I think about.